Gerard Libaridian, scholar, historian, and former deputy foreign minister of Armenia from 1991 to 1997. Dr. Libaridian served as advisor to President Levon de Bedrosian and was a negotiator for the Karabakh conflict at the time. Presently, Dr. Libaridian is the director of the Armenian <laughs> Studies Program and the Alex Manugian Chair in Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Dr. Libaridian, you can only imagine how honored we are to have you on our program. And we're going to ask you to help us move forward with your advice after the Armenian Azerbaijan War. Today, more than ever, we do need guidance, we do need information, and we do need visionary leadership. Just as we speak, news headlines inform us of a procession of dignity, they call it, that is kicking off in Yerevan, demanding the resurrection, resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. You have criticized the opposition as a group that applauded when Pashinyan rejected a compromise solution offered by Lavrov that could have left us in a better shape than we are now. And you have also criticized the opposition's problematic way of thinking. In 1990s, you had to face similar opposition. What are the similarities and or differences between developments today as opposed to what happened in 1990s and what best serves the interests of the nation today? Well, uh, thank you, Vartan, for this invitation. <coughs> uh, let, let me make a correction. Uh, I retired from the university some years ago, so I'm back in Boston. And uh, uh, I was there very happy to have worked in, at the great University of Michigan with the great colleagues and programs. Uh, but uh, I did retire early and uh, returned to Boston. I'm mostly writing in the last three years uh, uh, working with my grandson, mm -hmm. so, uh, who lives right next door. Now, uh, the question of similarities and differences <clears throat> has many uh, aspects. One is that, <clears throat> in fact, Prime Minister Pashinyan uh, never uh, offered a concrete plan for a negotiated peace, unfortunately. Uh, while in our time, Der Bedrosian did. That is, uh, Pashinyan never presented what were the risks of war, what were the risks for peace, uh, while Der Bedrosian did. So, in in our time, uh, the public was aware of the dangers of war. And even though, and we thought that we were at that time, let's say 95, 96, 97, in the best possible pos position to extract the most out of negotiations. We knew that over a period of time, uh, at least the military advantage would move on the side of Azerbaijan. And we did not think that we should take a risk with war. We wanted to take risks with peace. So, <clears throat> uh, but after our administration, Der Bedrosian's administration, that position changed. Uh, subsequent leaders thought that they had time, that time was on our side, and that if there was another war, which was of course, going to come regardless, uh, the, uh, that we could win, no matter what. So we underestimated the damage that time would do to our position, a relative position. We underestimated what the opponent can do in terms of gathering support mm -hmm. and overestimated what we could do. We thought more about what we wanted rather than what we needed. So uh, I can go on with this you know, fundamental difference, but uh, the important thing is that throughout this period, 
the opposition that is in the streets today in Yerevan, mm -hmm. that is the Republican Party, the uh, 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 the Zarugian Party, uh, Parkava Chayastan, uh, the Tashnak Tutun, and others, they have never criticized Kocharyan or Sarksyan or Pashinyan for their very uh, tough positions, for the risks for war that these positions entailed. Mm -hmm. They were very supportive. These were the parties, of course, Zarugyan didn't have a party then, but many, uh, the Tashnakshun and others, who criticized us for trying to negotiate a peace rather than risk war. Mm -hmm. And they supported Pashinyan's tough position before the war, after the war, and they were ready to criticize. So when uh, we think about, uh, about today demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Pashinyan, I see two fundamental issues. I think they are using this to get into government when they could not win the votes to be in government. Mm -hmm. The Hara Bedagan party, the Tashnak Tutun, did not get any more, in, enough to get into parliament even, which was four or five percent of the popular vote mm -hmm. during the last parliamentary election. Now they want to say Pashinyan was wrong. What they are doing is saying, they're not criticizing the, the overall mentality that led to war, which was likely to lead to defeat, they are criticizing the way it was conducted. But I do not know that their government, if they were the government, would have conducted it any differently. Mm -hmm. The problem was that we should have never gotten into a war when we know that Azerbaijan was getting stronger, when we know that Turkey was more and more supportive of Azerbaijan, practically supporting, not just diplomatically, when we knew that the world did not agree with us in two of our expectations, mm -hmm. that we could keep the seven districts that were Azerbaijani and are uh, under control, the world, every country, our friends and enemies, Russia, Turkey, Iran, everyone has been telling us you have to return those no matter why you got what you got. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they have been telling us for 30 years we will never recognize Garapal's independence. Okay, so we ignored all of that. We didn't think it mattered. We thought if we had good diplomats, we could convince the world that we could keep. And but worse than that, many of us never thought about negotiations seriously. We thought about our own. What we want is just. Therefore, that we don't have to worry about it. All we need to do is want. This is the mentality that led us to disregarding any signals that came from the other side that we could, in fact, negotiating, deciding early on that, no, there's nothing to negotiate, mm -hmm. that the problem is resolved. So with this kind of mentality, which was long before Pashinya, it was there against us in 1990s, right? So with all of this, I think responsibility rests with all of these guys. And finally, in response to the question, I wonder what will happen if the opposition that is in the streets now, that supported this kind of uh, non unwise policy over the decades, mm -hmm. what happens if they come to power now? Mm -hmm. Okay, they have not criticized themselves. They have not recognized that there was a problem with their mentality. And then they come, and then they've also been in government they have uh, had fraudulent elections, they have developed oligarchs, they have defended oligarchs, and they have uh, taught our new generations to be extra nationalistic, extreme nationalistic, and they're going to come to government to resolve what issue? You know, this I agree with you talking about the opposition, but let me just remind you that based on recent reports, uh, President Armin Sarkisian has been meeting with uh, community leaders and officials, and this is what he said. He said, the overwhelming majority agree on one point, resignation of the prime minister 
in accordance with the Constitution, the cessation of his official duties, and early parliamentary elections. And others have said, only after Pashinian leaves can we find our dignity again and get back on our feet. What is your take of these positions, especially of the president of Armenia? Well, the, you know, that's, uh, there are a couple of uh, points with regard to that. I do think that the prime minister has lost credibility. He has lost authority. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, he was elected by the people, by an overwhelming uh, vote, uh, and his party was elected. Now, he has misjudged, and he is not, I think, in a position uh, to continue governing. I agree with that much. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, how do you go to the next elections? Mm -hmm. uh, the president of Armenia has proposed a coalition government. I think that would be the death of Armenia. Really? Because these parties, if the analysis is right that their mentality is no different than Pashinyan's and even worse, their back background, their history is of fraudulent elections and stealing from the people and uh, governments of uh, oligarchs and extreme nationalism, if they are now in power, six, seven of them, to organize elections, what do you think they will do with those elections? Hmm. Okay? They will make sure that they uh, reproduce themselves, that they come back to power. And assuming they come back to power, where are we with now what needs to be done for the future of Armenia and what is left of Garapal? They will not be able to govern to resolve those issues better than what Pashinyan could. So uh, I would be very much against, you know, unity is, uh, is not in itself a purpose, okay? Just be if, uh, as I've written at some point, if Pashinyan is wrong, mm -hmm. 17 times of 17 parties who are wrong does not make it right. It makes 17 wrongs. That's what it makes. So I think in order for the constitution to function, the solution would be that yes, the prime minister resigns. Uh, because he personally uh, has, bears a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But to respect the constitution, his party that is still in parliament appoints another par prime minister from their own party or from outside. It, hopefully, it could also be from the outside if there's, uh, uh, I think there may be one person there who could do the job, whose job would be to organize new elections mm -hmm. and to care for now the POWs, the refugees, the return of Armenians to Garapa, all the immediate issues. So I would say that, yes, uh, it would be best if Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan left his party appointed someone new because they still have the majority in parliament mm -hmm. and i trust them to organize elections i don't trust anyone else of the street parties to organize elections okay so they they have a new prime minister mm -hmm. who organizes elections and whoever wins uh, then becomes the new government it could be one party it could be a coalition of three but the people now have to give their a, a mandate after these after these uh, disastrous losses that is prime minister had a mandate until for another two years two and a half years but with the conditions we are in i don't think that a government has to have a new mandate during this campaign the uh, imkail my step pashinyan can campaign can explain can say what he sees needs to be done. All the other parties can do the same, will do the same. And then people, when they are fully informed of what happened, why it happened, mm -hmm. and what we need to do now, what are the issues to be resolved, and what are the solutions of each party, then I think we have a new government with a mandate. 
That's how the change should occur. Dr. Libaridian, uh, there are so many questions, and I really, really thank you and appreciate you giving us the time. You have written for the Armenian press, and all your writings have been translated into Armenian and other languages because people are interested in what you have to say. The Russian uh, broker uh, ceasefire mentions uh, two transport corridors. I personally am very interested in these. One is between Nakhichevan and Azerbaijan. The other one is the Lachin Corridor. Uh, there, are, there is no role for Turkish uh, peacekeepers. That's what I understand. How significant are these deals uh, which Armenia is uh, forced to accept? Are these acceptable to you, especially the corridor from Nakhichevan to Azerbaijan? What are your thoughts? Well, that's a very important question. Uh, first, uh, with regard to the November 10 agreement, which is the ceasefire agreement, we have to realize one thing, <clears throat> that it is a very fluid and dynamic mm -hmm. uh, document. That means that there are too many moving parts. Often in international agreements that are difficult to reach, a number of issues are left vague. That's called constructive vagueness. Because if we want to make it very precise, an agreement might not have been reached. So that's number one with regard to that document. It has many, many moving parts. Secondly, it is a document that was signed under duress, yes, mm -hmm. but that's the cost of losing a war. Mm -hmm. Now, any attempt to change it, whether we like it or not, any attempt to change it may trigger a new war and we can lose whatever is left. Okay? President Putin has made that very clear and President Putin should know because it's his diplomats who negotiated the deal. Okay? Uh, that agreement should have been signed, something like that should have been signed much earlier before the war, and we could have gotten much more with far less losses. That's number one. Number two, during the war, mm. there were moments where we could have stopped it before all the losses and w with far less territorial loss and loss of sovereignty. So, uh, but I'm glad it was signed. And once it was signed, we cannot and we should not try to change it but just because we don't like it. We have to accept certain things, that we lost the war. Whatever reason, was it treason? Was it we didn't have enough soldiers? Was it it was mis mismanaged? Regardless of that, the fact remains we lost the war. And with the loss of war, as I've indicated, we lost not only the districts we are talking about, the seven districts, mm -hmm. but also parts of the uh, Garapal Artsakh Republic itself, the autonomous region of, of uh, Nagorno Garapal of the Soviet period. Now, we also lost a degree of sovereignty for Armenia because now we have the southern border with the Russians, okay. we have the eastern border with the Russians, western border with the Russians. So, this is a second reality. And this is something we had pointed out before that the loss of Garafa will not just be a loss of Garafa. Now, the third important point with the ceasefire agreement is that without saying so explicitly, it recognizes Garafa in addition to the seven districts as part of Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. That document is an affirmation of the principle of territorial integrity and has no reference to uh, the principle of self-determination. Okay, the, when when the prime when uh, President Putin is talking and we are talking about negotiations on a status that yet to be determined, it is not between independence and uh, part of Azerbaijan. It is in what shape will it be part of Azerbaijan? Mm -hmm. This is the negotiation that will come if we have a chance to participate in it, because now the main decisions will be taken by Azerbaijan, Russia, and Turkey. Mm -hmm. This is the reality. This is not pleasant for me to say, 
This is not what I wanted. I certainly wanted something very different. But we, we have to stop dealing with what we want and our illusions and our great dreams. We have to deal with the realities. And the reality is we lost the war. We lost it badly. We had to sign an agreement, which is a bad agreement, but it is the agreement we have to abide with. And then we have now to change our mentality to see how we can deal with the realities and the dynamic parts of that ceasefire in order to get the most out of it. This is what we need yeah. to do. The reality also reminds us that we have many, many refugees in Yerevan. The reality is that we have wounded soldiers, uh, widowed orphan kids, we have pandemic, we have economy that has been shattered. So the reality is a very serious one. And the, my question to you is we see pictures of refugees going back home to Arapak. Some 30,000 Armenian refugees have so-called returned to Arapak and there are peacekeepers, Russian peacekeepers, which give us this image that everything is back to normal. What is the price we will pay or we are paying for that Russian protection? Well, without the Russian protection, we would have lost everything. So that's one reality, whether we like the Russians or not. <clears throat> they came for their own reasons, obviously, but they still came. The fact is they came and they were able to convince Azerbaijan and Turkey to stop somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, so we have to accept that. Second thing is that Russia has its own reasons for being there. So our future policy must understand that, must work with the Russians, and see how the mutual interests can complement each other and uh, to, in order to, as I said, maximize whatever is left of Garapal. The price is that Russia has more say so in the future of Garapa, it has more say so in even what happens in Armenia. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's the reality and that's what we have to live with. That also means that we have to come to terms with one thing, with this war. You see, Russia had um, more, the wider geopolitical goals. Garapa is only one element of that. And that goal, as far as the region is concerned, <clears throat> is to detach Turkey from NATO and from the U.S. Okay? That's that goal. Now, you want to go and te preach uh, Putin that his interest is with the Garapa Armenians? You know, you can do all you want, but the Russians have been telling us, we know our interests, don't tell us our interest. Just understand them. So, Russia was able to kick out the U.S. and France from the region by sharing the South Caucasus with Turkey. Now, they will, they agree in general to keep out the U.S. and Turkey's influence increases at the expense of West, of the West and the U.S. and France. But it doesn't mean that Russia and Turkey agree on everything. So there's going to be a battle now, an ongoing, slow motion, hopefully slow motion, uh, rivalry, uh, to what extent can Russia now keep Turkey out of Azerbaijan, okay? Uh, and that is uh, to some extent up to Azerbaijan because they're an independent country and they can bring Turkish troops to their country if they want to. Mm -hmm. Just as we have our American troops in Turkey, we have Russian troops in Armenia, they can bring Turkish troops to uh, Azerbaijan. And uh, we need to calculate these and not um, uh, get the sword and surjojel, you know, as we say in Armenian, you know, to say Turks are bad, Azerbaijanis are bad. Well, they're all bad, okay? Yes, they are all bad. And if they were bad, then why didn't we behave according to that knowledge? There's a paradox in Armenian thinking, political thinking. Turks are dangerous, Azerbaijanis are dangerous, Turks are genocidal. In which case, we should behave uh, with that knowledge, all right? But what we do is we go and uh, provoke Turkey. We go and provoke Azerbaijan. We, uh, our words, we don't account for what we say and what we do. If, if there's a, 
if there's a lion lying down and I'm there, I don't go and poke that lion, do I? I let it sleep. But we went and poked. So what I'm saying is the analysis of the past, of what went wrong, is not just to say that Libaridian was right or De Bedrosian was right. It's to say that there's a way of thinking that leads you to this. And we understand that. And then we see how can we change in order not to lose the rest. Dr. Libaridian, uh, were you asked by the government of Armenia, by Nikol Pashinyan, to help out in negotiations? And if you were asked, would you go and help them? Well, these are two different questions. What was the case in the past and what may be in the future? Okay. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I, uh, I can say that I have offered my analysis, my predictions, my assessment, and my advice at the highest levels of the Armenian government in the last two and a half years. Okay? Mm -hmm. That much I can say. And I've done it personally. Uh, you know, and uh, now, in the future, you know, I, it is, um, first of all, I, I am not looking for a job. I'm quite happy to listening to music, ra help raise my grandson, and write. I have so many projects, writing projects. I'm preparing a five-volume publication of my works now in Armenia. So the question is, uh, not whether I serve or not, or whether I'm asked. The question is, will there be a change of mentality? If there's a change of mentality, it doesn't matter with, whether I do negotiating or not. Mm -hmm. But we have first to have a change of mentality to realize what is, it, what is negotiable now, okay? Mm -hmm. As I said, our choices are now much narrower what is negotiable, and uh, once we decide that, then what do we do? How do we think in order not to lose what is left? So if you have a government, if, if it's Pashinyan or someone who thinks like him, it doesn't matter whether it's Libaridian negotiating or not, all right? It's more important for me that there be a government that thinks differently Mm -hmm. that thinks with real issues, real facts, and sees what is the best possible thing we can extract from a very fluid situation now. You know, many times we mention the diaspora as a very important card Armenia has, and we have a very, very powerful diaspora. And uh, somehow we also know that the diaspora energy has not been harnessed to serve Armenian needs. My question to you is, we also need to know the past to move forward. Obviously, we've heard that many times. But I think no matter how much we speak about the past, it is the present that is of interest to us. And also, where are we going is super important. I think when we drive a car, it's where we look in front. What can you do to help us understand the present situation in terms of inspiring or giving direction to the diaspora Armenians, especially the American Armenians? Because this is your community. This is the community you grew up with. You know them very well. Well, Vartan, uh, that's a very significant question. Uh, in thinking of the future, whether of Armenia or diasporan help and diasporan contribution, uh, we are in a situation where it's much easier and much more constructive to say what we should not do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, in medicine, there's the term, there is a guidance to the doctors. First, do no harm. <laughs> And I think with all the positive assistance that diaspora has given through individuals, through organizations, we have done tremendous damage to Armenia's future and Garapal's future by supporting extreme nationalism to Armenia, by demanding, contributing to what is impossible. So 
what we have exported to Armenia from the diaspora has not been a wise policy. And on the other hand, since 1997, 98, mm -hmm. particularly with President Kocharyan and then uh, less with President Serge Sarkisyan and again more with President uh, with Prime Minister Pashinyan, we have given um, assigned capabilities to the diaspora which it does not have. We are very strong. We are very, uh, a good portion of us are dedicated to Armenia and Armenian causes. But it does not mean that what we do is always right. This we have to realize. We could do a great deal if the diaspora stopped through its organizations giving advice to Armenia on negotiations, on compromises, okay? Because the Armenians in Armenia and governments have continued to believe that the diaspora is the equivalent of Azerbaijan's oil and gas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when, in 1998, we did an analysis uh, under Der Bedrosya as to what was the situation, what are the scenarios for Garapal? We did this very serious analysis and we came up with a report, and that report indicated that we had no choice. The safest choice was to negotiate at that time and to reach an agreement when we were strong. Now, uh, I left government at the end of 97, and Der Bedrosian resigned a couple of months later. And mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he was forced to resign because his prime minister, Defense Minister Vaskin, Prime Minister Kocharyan, and uh, Minister Serge Sarkisyan went against his compromise agreement, okay? They went against it. Now, they did not disagree that we were in a few years in a, we would be in a bad position. They agreed with that. What they disagreed with was that, yes, Azerbaijan will have more money, will, has more friends, uh, and will get more investments and have, will have more money to buy arms and technology. But in return, in uh, opposite to that, we have the diaspora. And someone had suggested from the diaspora <clears throat> that if Der Bedrosian was no longer president, and if we talked about uh, not an inch back, watch me tis ho talis, and if we talked about the genocide, if we adopted the diasporan agenda, in fact, then the diaspora would contribute 500 to 600 million dollars a year in investments. Okay? This was their argument. No matter what we said, that the diaspora does not have that. Will, it will not happen no matter what you do because there is no diasporan wealth. There is the wealth of diasporan individuals. Mm -hmm. Armenian organizations are not wealthy. The wealthiest is AGBU, and it's limited as to what it can do, mm -hmm. okay? Gulbengian is not an Armenian organization. It's a Portuguese organization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The and the ARS, there's a limit as to what it can do with its money. It's, these are charitable organizations. Political parties don't have any money. They always raise, they always raise money for, by whatever means possible. And it's individuals who are going to contribute. We do not have a collective capital, okay? Mm. We do not have an Armenian bank where all Armenians have their money. We do not have a diasporan organizations that brings together the leaders that develop policy and organize ways to harness Armenian, wealthy Armenians, capital to invest in Armenia. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. The diaspora is powerful, but that's a very, very dubious term as far as I'm concerned. I'm not saying it hasn't done anything. It's done great. But we have to know what it can and it cannot do. And certainly there's no such thing as diasporan five, six hundred million dollars of investment. Der Bedrosian was gone. Kocharyan talked about genocide. Kocharyan talked about not giving an inch back. And what did he get? He got less investment than we did. Dr. Lee, 
So you know, it's it's truly a, not only an honor, but it's also a pleasure to talk to you. One last question I have, because there are so many, I don't want to overdo it, uh, is the idea of uh, thinking of bringing peace to the people in the region, working towards peace. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, um, that's a dangerous question as well as a very important one. The higher the risks, the higher the profits. You know, it, it, it is dangerous, of course, now. But what are your thoughts it's about it? dangerous because if you start talking about the need for peace, then uh, you will con I will be continued uh, of, of being accused of um, forgetting what Turkey did, what Azerbaijan did. I brought it, it up. I brought okay. it up. You did not. No, no. It. I know. I'm going to answer. It doesn't matter. I've been accused of so much. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I think what I think. Uh, and I speak what I think after I've thought about it 10 times. Mm -hmm. I don't say anything that comes to my mind. So, a uh, long time ago, uh, in fact, in 1989, 1990, you know that I was a Tashnak Sagan member, right? And then I left in 88 because I could not understand or accept or justify the position of my party with regard to the Garapal movement and the future of Garapal and an independent army. I couldn't, so I left. The argument for, let's say, the Tashnaksun going against independence of Armenia was that, look, uh, Turkey is there, it's powerful. If we are not a part of the Soviet Union, or Russia, they'll come and massacre us, okay? So my argument was that, okay, let's suppose that is true. Then there's no chance we can become independent, right? So let's stop talking about independence. Because there's no mathematical chance, and I said this publicly then, that Turkey will pack up its bags, go somewhere else, and it's Switzerland that's going to come as neighbor to us. That's as simple as that. There's no chance. There's no chance Azerbaijan will leave and Italy will come. And we will go to see Gina Lolo Brigida movies. You know, there's no chance of that. So we are there. If we want to be independent, we have to understand one thing. We have to get along with our neighbors and resolve whatever we have through negotiations. And secondly, it is important to understand that the behavior of Azerbaijan and Turkey are not innate. They are not born what they are. There are political cultures that are different than ours maybe, but we have to realize one thing. What we say and do matters in what they say and they do, okay? This we have not come to understand, Vartan, mm -hmm. that what we say matters. What we do matters. So that when you, you sit and why is it that during seven years that, you know, we were, I was in the government and I was the chief negotiator with Turkey for bilateral relations. We went and occupied seven districts and all turkey did was say okay we can't have bilateral relations and uh, we're stopping uh, the the wheat that was coming to you from europe through turkey okay why is it that when we were doing that that's all that happened from turkey mm -hmm. and then when everything was quiet that no war we end up with Turkey being a party to the conflict and helping. Why is that? It's not just that Erdogan is, came and Erdogan was different than Demirel. It is also because of what we talked at the time, what we discussed, the way we talked to them, the way we, we discussed real interests as opposed to. So coming back to your question, and we kept all lines open, even when we no longer were negotiating the protocol. I used to go to Ankara. I invited Turkish officials to come to Yerevan. We discussed issues. We had a telephone line, not organized in any way, but I could pick up the phone and talk to my 
uh, come uh, to, to my interlocutor in Turkey, talk to the minister in Turkey, mm -hmm. talk even to the prime minister. The president could talk, and we did this to keep things quiet, to say what we're trying to do to resolve this conflict, and we kept things quiet, right? So we have to accept the fact that what, ma what we do matters, and sometimes it matters less, sometimes more. What we say, sometimes Turkey is more determined to do evil or more to the determined to do good. We never uh, remember when Turkey has done good. We don't remember that when we were going to starve in Armenia in the winter of 92, the railroad from Abkhazia bringing Russian wheat or an European wheat to us was closed because of the war there, mm -hmm. that we asked Turkey and Turkey immediately said yes, and they transported European wheat from the Black Sea ports to Leningrad. They did it on their own. And when there wasn't enough European, they provided wheat from their own uh, reserves. Okay? I, I say this, uh, and people want to forget it. You know, this is the mentality we have. We do not look at the facts. We look at anything that is bad that we can say about Turkey, we say. Nothing that is good, we want to admit. Same with Azerbaijan. So we have to realize this and 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 uh, and, and act accordingly. We have to accept the following. If we want to be independent as a country, and if there has to be a degree of independence where we define our interests mm -hmm. and not someone else, not where, not where we are now, where Putin is deciding for Armenia, right? If we are going to be independent, then we have to come to terms with our two neighbors. We have, at some point, not today, not tomorrow, but maybe in a little while, we have to start talking to them and start solving our own problems. Okay? And so uh, we have to go from, uh, from a position of weakness, unfortunately, no longer from a position of strength. In 96, 97, I was in Ankara and told Prime Minister uh, Mesut Yilmaz mm -hmm. that. You know, I said, uh, you have decided not to open the border and the bilateral relations with Armenia because of the conflict of Garapa. We, we understand that. Now, we want you to understand one thing. That Armenia is no longer in a position where we're looking for wheat tomorrow. We've resolved that issue. Armenia is not in a position where we're looking for electricity to buy from someplace. We have more electricity and we can sell it to you now. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough electricity in Eastern Turkey. We can sell it to you. We are in a position where we are talking about this, thinking about the next 10 or 20 years. Now, in this thinking, how would you want us to think about Turkey? Would you want to, us to think about Turkey as a threat to Armenia? or as part of our understanding and security system, which requires bilateral relations? That's the question I put to him. You know, I, I don't want to stop you here, but there is always this question of uh, denying the genocide issue, which has been so close to our hearts. That has always been the wrench that has been thrown in any negotiation over the years. Maybe we can overlook as we think of the future. I don't know what kind of answer you had at the time. Well, our answer was that the recognition of genocide was not the, the issue on which you, we decide uh, whether to have relations with Turkey or not. It's very simple. It would be easier to resolve that if we had normal relations, if we had built some trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we had built some communications, okay, you cannot resolve it. That is not the, the basis of policy. 
because it shouldn't be the basis of policy. Armenia's security, okay, is more important than anything else. Now, many people, according, including some parties, have said, Turkey is genocidal, and it will remain genocidal if it doesn't recognize the mm -hmm. genocide. Mm -hmm. But I say, no, it hasn't been genocidal. It has dealt with us. It has dealt according to its interest, but it has not been genocidal. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen what Rair Marukhyan or the Tashnaksyun predicted, the moment we're independent, they're going to come and massacre the rest of us. That didn't happen. That hasn't happened even now. It hasn't happened. So that argument is false, and I think it is better, we have a better chance of dealing with that issue slowly when we have normalized relations, rather than make that a precondition and then go nowhere and constantly um, campaign against Turkey as if it will be. Let's say Turkey recognized the genocide tomorrow, okay? If its interest required, regardless, it will come and fight Armenia. Okay, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And without recognizing the genocide, it has not attacked. So we have to stop thinking of this um, of policy as innate, as born with you. Turks are genocidal and others are not. Look, um, Turkey is not the only country that has committed genocide, is it? The United States has committed genocide. And it has not recognized. But we are citizens of this country. We are proud of this country. We want this country to resolve, to put pressure on Turkey to recognize the genocide. We want the US to do so many things. So there's a degree of hypocrisy in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's the political issue, the psychological issue, and the strategic issue. On a personal basis, Vartan, I don't care if Turkey recognizes or not. I've told them, it's your problem. You lose your sleep. We mm -hmm. lost uh, what we lost, and you lose your sleep because you don't recognize it. You don't accept it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to allow that issue to, to darken my clear thinking as what are the needs of an independent Armenia. You know, lately I've been watching some uh, interviews you have uh, conducted, and there are quite a few of them. And in one of the mini seminars you had, you had mentioned one of your professors who had told you that when small republics make mistakes, they pay for their mistakes. And when the big powers make mistakes, it's the small republics that pay them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in, in fact, it was not a professor. Who was he? He was a. In 1965, this was, uh -huh. when I was a college student. Could you tell us the story? Because it's a very yes. important one. This was a, I was taking a course in political philosophy. Okay. First year in college, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I loved politics and I loved philosophy and I want to see what, and that means starting to study texts from Plato and Aristotle all the way to Hume and, you know, whatever. So. Uh, Machiavelli uh, and etc. So next to me was sitting a man who was much older than any one of us in the classroom. And my English was very bad because in Beirut my education was in French. But I, I was studying very hard. I was always lived with dictionaries and all the time working in a factory, you know, and I went to college St working in a wire factory from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. and then went to college, right? But I, I always had a dictionary with me. I also had a chess game, portable chess game. I played against myself So uh, when I was working. So uh, anyway, uh, at one point after the third or fourth lecture, this older student came and said, Meh, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And he said, uh, I have a question. Do you understand everything the professor is saying? And I said, well, no, because there are words I still don't know. There are some expressions. I write them down and study. He said, no, 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 I'm not talking about English. But he said, the concept. He said, what does philosophy have to do with politics? Okay. And I said, well, 
you know, it's the text you read and say how to think about politics, what is politics, etc. He said, can I, can I, he said, I'm asking because you have always questions to the professor. Mm -hmm. That means you're understanding what we are reading and what the professor, professor is talking about. He said, can you do me a favor? I know you work hard, but what if on Sundays I bring a six pack of beer? I was also very poor. And for one hour, we, we read one paragraph of, let's say, Plato, and you tell me what happens to your mind. What occurs in your mind when you read that text? What, what happens? And I said, fine. So that's what we did. But meanwhile, we started talking about Vietnam. Among everything I was doing, I was one of the first anti-Vietnam War demonstrators in Los Angeles. Okay? I didn't think it was a good war. I thought it was a bad war. I thought it was going to end bad. And in, this is in 65, 66. Okay? And he told me that he just came back from Vietnam. He had been one of the first military advisors President Kennedy sent to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Then the advisors were followed by the armies, right? And he said he was 16 when he went into the army. He mm -hmm. lied about his age. And 20 years of service, he retired at 36 from the army. And now he wanted to understand certain things, so he starts college. Now, so, and, uh, and I said, yeah, well, good, I, I'm against that war. So we started arguing about that war over a period of weeks. And then at the end, he came and said, you know, I checked about you guys, Armenians. You've had a rough, rough, rough time in this world. You, you've been massacred, you've been kicked, you've been <laughs> refugees and all. And he said, but you know, <clears throat> and he said, you know more history than I do. You know more geography than I do. He said, two and a half years I was in Vietnam, and this world map you have, I'm not sure I can pinpoint exactly where Vietnam is. It doesn't matter to me. He said, I learned one thing from reading about your history and from everything that we have talked about, that when we, a big country, said, you say Vietnam is a mistake. Well, we make mistakes. When you make mistakes, he said, as Armenians, you pay for it. When we make mistakes, you still pay for it. That's an amazing story. Amazing. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing the way you tell us all the details. It's, yeah. it's a very important lesson for all of us. Uh, Dr. Libaridian, I don't know if I have a lot of well, in Nagan, hard said the Vianne. Were men Vorosh Matainu tuning, Vorosh Agangalu tune running, Vorosh Hashwag Nerunink, Vonosmov Gatadenk, the ice hearts inch pest lutzenk. Para Pari hearts, I miss hearts in the inch. Եվ այդ հիմ այդ մտայնությունը հիմնված է մեր երազներուն վրա։ Մեզի համար ավելի կարևոր է այն ինչ որ մենք կուզենք, ոչ թե այն ինչ որ մեզ բացարձակապես անհրաժեշտ է։ Եվ այդ անգարելին յետևեն էր տալով, որովհետև իրականությունը չեն կուզեր դեսնել։ Անգարելին յետևեն էր տալով գարելին գործ ընցնել։ Որովհետև մեր ուժը ուրիշ դեր գտնել։ Betke is a sink Iraganutuner desnel. Betke is a sink Madazela Gerber, Yezraga Tutunema, or Orinak Panatutuner Garilichen, near Gu Yerek Pang, Gumadazen, Yevedok Sek, Panatutuner Octagarchen. Betke is a spenisk sink, or Nagara Pari Hartsem Madazelutseva. Yes, a Seska hot was Munim, or Ima Gverchatsem. Hedeviane. Menke sank Garilichevestahil. Panachutun Nero Kutchunin, as Martik and Marta Spanen, Yevalen Yevalen Yevalen, Gan Martik Sen, Garapari Hartz Lutzwadzer, Lutzwadzer, Menk Panchunen, Aderbejan problem Muni, Togerta, Yev Mornalov or Pastoren, Aderbejan Mer Hagara Gortne, 
Եթե մեր հագարագորդը չնդուն իր այս լուծումը որ գա մեր հաղթանակի վրա նստած Այնադեն հարցը չէ լուծված մենք մեզ հետ չէ որ գփանակցին կամ բետ գփանակցին ուրիշին հետ է գփանակցին ամբողջ աշխարի հետ է գփանակցին ուրեմն հարցը չէ լուծված ուրիշներ գսեին հարցը չէ լուծված բայց լուծում չկա առանց իսկ ապես մտածա զլալ թե փոլոր գարելիությունները փորձած են թե ոչ նույնիսկ համար գսենք մակփանե շատ զիջում չուզեր բայց մենք ա զիջում չենք ուզեր Եթե գսենք անգախություն ուզենք, դարացքները պիտի բահենք, ալ ինչ ինչ մնաց զիջել, որ որ ու վրա զիջած ենք, չէ, բամ չենք զիջած։ Ուրեմն գան մարտիկ որ գսեն, հա լուծումը գրնակ կդնել, բայց սպասենք։ 5 տասը դարի հետո գզորանանք հետո։ Բայց ես քրած եմ եւ ասած եմ, մենք ժամանակ ճունինք, ժամանակը անցավ եւ անոնք պիտի հարցագին։ այդ հարցագումը չեղած պետք է մտածենք ինչ կրնանք ողել եւ անել հիմա ուրեմ մենք պետք է մտածենք հետեւյալ ցեղով թիվ մեկ մենք խնդիր ունենք թե ոչ is there a problem or not թիվ մեկ եթե խնդիր ունենք որու պրոբլեմն է մերն է թե մոսկվայինն է թե վաշինգտոնինն է եթե մերն է մենք պետք է աշխատենք լուծել ոչ թե հյուրի բեսը սпасել որ համանախակաոները մեզի առաջարկներ պեր են մենք պրոբլեմ ունենք մենք պետք է լուծենք չորրորդ այդ լուծումը գրնանք սпасել 20 դարի եւս թե ոչ պատասխանի որ չես կնար սпасել բայց եթե գորոշես կնաս սпасել այնադեն դու մի սпасես որ բադերազմ լա եւ այնադեն ուժեր ու հարաբերությունը ինչ է հարաբերի բանով ուրեմն մտածելու ցերն է ուր դեղեն սկսիս մտածել Եթե ոչ են գսկսիս ես ռագացիներով գսկսիս դեր չես ասնիր եթե դեր պիտի ասնիս արմադավես հարցը անչե որ Ալիևը վստահելի է Էրդողանը վստահ ոչ ոք վստահելի չէ մենք ալ վստահելի չենք համացայնությունները վստահության վրա չեն հիմնվիր այնքան որքան շահերու վրա եւ գարողություններու վրա եւ այն է որ հիմա հայաստանի բարակային Հարապավ մեծ մասը գործունցին մեր իր բան գարողությունը Հարապավի աբական ճշտելու գործունցին մեր մասնակցությունը նվազեցավ շատ եւ հիմա բայց տագավին այդ համացայնությունը որ կա նոյ ինպեր դասի հեղ հեղուգ է մեծ շարժուն մասերը շատ են եւ խնդիրը հիմա ունենալ է նմա այնպիսի մտածելագեր եւ թիվանագիտություն որ ուրեմն այդ կարելիությունները գասնե իր արավելակույն շահին մեզի ոչ թե այն ինչ որ գուզենք այն ինչ կերազենք այլ այն ինչ որ գրնանք այսօր այս փոլոր պայմաններու մեջ առնել դոկտոր լիբարիդյան մի են գրնան կսել 3 անգամ շնորհակալ ենք շնորհակալ ենք շնորհակալ ենք շնորհակալ ենք 4 անգամ ասի հարի օր խնդրեմ վարտան ուրախ եմ արի թդվիր հաղթ աչողություն ստեսյուն ստեսյուն